What's going on guys, this is Rob, and despite having ran this channel for about eight years, one thing that we haven't done is make a video explaining Dr. Octopus. <laughs> and I'm kind of astounded that we haven't done that. So we're gonna do it here. In this video, I'm gonna make you guys an expert on Dr. Octopus in about 30 minutes or so. The origin of Dr. Octopus is actually found in a few different locations. The most comprehensive origin is actually found in Dr. Octopus Year One, which was really a multi-issue telling of Dr. Octopus's full origin. But some of the stuff that actually appears in Spider-Man Unlimited Limited number 18 and Amazing Spider-Man issue number three actually doesn't appear in Dr. Octopus year one. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of combine these three particular stories to form the origin as we know it, right? So what we know is that Dr. Octopus was born in uh, in New York and basically had a abusive father and a, I wouldn't really say loving mother, more of like an overprotective and overbearing mother, right? But she was in a lot of ways, the antithesis to the father of Otto Octavius. The reason why is because the father of Otto Octavius really advocated violence as a means to solve problems. Now, that was one of the things that Stan Lee and, and Steve Ditko and even Jack Kirby in non-Spider-Man stories largely focused on in these early days, that violence should be a last resort. I personally disagree. I think violence is not always the answer, but it is a answer and it's usually a very effective one. <laughs> violence gets things done. But at this point in time, that wasn't really the philosophy. It's one of the things that actually made Spider-Man so popular is that he would only ever fight if he absolutely had to. And so because of this, the, the abusive nature of Otto's father was met in a couple different ways. The first was that he would always advocate that Otto use violence in dealing with like bullies or, or anything like that. And the second is that he would actually beat his son. And so because of this, the antithesis to that was Otto's mother who always approached things from a much gentler hand. And so ultimately the father of Otto actually ended up dying. And, uh, and from there he had attended MIT and become one of its most prestigious students actually graduating at the top of his class. Now, during his whole time, during the, the really the motivation for attending MIT and becoming as intelligent as he was, was the philosophy of his mother, which is one, that being a manual laborer is nothing to celebrate, right? And that two, an early death is the result of a person being a manual laborer. Now, we know that's not the case. <laughs> you know, I shudder to think of a world where we don't have masons or we don't have plumbers, right? I mean, those guys are like a necessary part of society, right? So because of that, like we know that's not necessarily the case, but that was the philosophy she held and a philosophy she instilled in Otto Octavius. But the other part of this is that in the absence of his father, the relationship between his mother and himself became extremely important. Now, it didn't really approach anything in the realm of impropriety, but what it did approach is this idea that Otto Octavius really began to kind of live his life based on his mother's standards. And all this really came to a head when he ended up meeting a girl named Mary Anders. Now, the two of them fell in love, they dated, they were head over heels, they got engaged, but the mother of Otto did not like the idea of him having another woman in his life because she felt like nobody else was good enough. And because he was at this point living his life based on his mother's standards, he ultimately broke off his engagement only to find out that his mother was dating somebody else. And so he kind of came to this or came out of it with a feeling of betrayal that his mother's philosophy was don't do as I do, do as I say do, right? But he felt as though he was his own man. He should be able to do his own thing. But the decision had already come too late. Mary Andrews was already gone. She had basically moved on to do her own thing. His mother had basically died of a heart attack when he lashed out at her after learning that she was in a relationship with somebody else. And so all this did was really coalesce in the mind of, uh, of Otto Octavius, bringing him to a place where he had in extreme mental struggles. The anxiety and the stress that came with graduating at the top of his class at MIT, combined with the guilt and the anger he felt, you know, basically leading to his mother's death and, and the fact that she was dating somebody behind his back or telling him, you can't have anybody, but I can, right? That kind of a thing. All that had kind of come to a head when he had found a job working at the, the US Atomic Research Center. Now, this basically had him developing what were called his chest harnesses or his chest tentacles, if you want to call them that. It's the tentacles that you guys are the most familiar with, right? The ones that you control that, that do all kinds of different things. Initially, they were they just existed based on simple programming, right? I mean, they were developed by him and that was really it. But what ended up happening here is that due to the mental struggles that he was, was suffering with, this ultimately led to him screwing up on the job, making a mistake and being splashed with chemicals. Now, the reason why this happens, this is something that I want to clear up. The reason why it was him being splashed with chemicals as opposed to, you know, some kind of just desire to create these super advanced robotic arms and just sort of going crazy of his own of his own accord is because this was the 1960s and we were already coming hot off the heels of Barry Allen in 1956 over at DC Comics when Barry became the Flash, right? Struck by lightning, doused in chemicals, gained super speed. And so because of that kind of thing, the blending of science fiction and superhero themes was really what saved the comic book industry in the 1950s. So it was standard practice even going into the 1960s to take this kind of science fiction concept and apply it to comic books. It's the reason why Peter Parker got his powers from 
a radioactive spider as opposed to being you know receiving magic at the hands of somebody like dr strange that gave him spider-man powers it's the reason why the fantastic four gained their powers from like cosmic radiation as opposed to just scientific advancement whatever the case is it was all that kind of sci-fi stuff that really led to the kind of formation of the villains and even the superheroes that we're familiar with today right the important thing here is that uh, after making this mistake two things happen the first is that instead of his arms being controlled based on programming that was created by by Otto Octavius he could now mentally control them and the second thing that happened is that he had basically gone insane right that's basically what it was right developed a, a high level of narcissism and even really sociopathy depending on who you're talking to now that whole idea of him becoming like a you know an extreme narcissist a megalomaniac that kind of a thing that was just Stan Lee and Jack Kirby giving us a motivation for why Spider-Man has to fight him in the first place right it's pretty simple relative to what you see today but for the most part we just kind of roll with it and just say okay cool right is a product of the time and just kind of call it a day now what ended up happening is that him recovering he realized that given his exceedingly high level of intelligence his narcissism his megalomania all that kind of stuff that he could actually just initiate these massive campaigns and possibly even conquer like huge portions of society right that it basically led him on this this gave him this grandiose sense of self and so what he started doing was actually kidnapping and snatching up a whole bunch of lab staff which ultimately led to him coming into conflict with spider-man now that was one of the major differences between somebody like Otto octavius and somebody like the chameleon mysterio villains that would come after Otto octavius is that unlike a lot of those guys that Otto overpowered peter parker like that right it happened so fast he he defeated him quite readily now that wasn't really a result of Otto octavius's intelligence and powers it was to a degree but a lot of it was also the way that peter parker was written that peter was still learning what it meant to be spider-man as his stories were unfolding and so he was still approaching different situations from this idea that hey like everything can be talked out he hadn't quite learned the lesson that there are some villains that while you never kill them you just hammer on them with overwhelming force as fast as you possibly can and take them out as quickly as you can right a lot of people would probably argue the green goblin is really when that started to shift up that the green goblin is the one that changed spider-man's perception especially after the death of gwen stacy now going into their second skirmish peter parker came back and defeated dr octopus with one punch and that was really more of a development for peter parker right that us as the the readers of spider-man realizing spider-man was a lot stronger than he thought he was and indeed peter parker himself realizing he was actually a lot stronger than he was a lot of that went towards like you know with great power must come great responsibility so with that level of strength must come an equal amount of restraint to keep himself from just like you know punching the head off of a villain or beating somebody to death and so that was a, a cool little development for him but of course ultimately dr octopus was was locked up now eventually dr octopus came into contact with a guy by the name of blocky gaxton now this was a guy who was closely associated with betty brandt the reality of this is that this particular era in dr octopus's life was really more development for peter parker than it was for dr octopus and the reason why i say this is because blocky gaxton's involvement with with betty brandt who of course at the time was the girlfriend of peter parker was really a result of betty's brother bennett and the way this played out was that betty and bennett had a mother who had basically had you know extreme medical bills and so bennett ended up finding himself in a gambling debt with blackie gaxton that he couldn't pay off this ultimately led to bennett and betty being kidnapped by blackie gaxton and then dr octopus operating more as what seemed to be a kind of hired hand than anything else and ultimately spider-man basically responded and so this led to what was actually a fight between spider-man and uh, and dr octopus as well as a skirmish with blackie gaxton during which time bennett brandt was killed and so the result of this was that it actually kind of gave us this revelation on behalf of Peter Parker that he couldn't save everybody and this flew in the face of superhero themes as we knew them right up until that point in time superheroes pretty much always saved everybody right it was just it was the nature of things even in DC Comics Iris West the wife of Barry Allen had not been killed by Eobard Thawne yet so we hadn't really crossed that bridge of the superhero the the tried and true superhero being as popular as he was being unable to save somebody right it was a rule since since like Superman and Lois Lane it was a rule that like the hero always came out on top he always saved the innocent people this development with peter parker was really the first stage that really came to a head with gwen stacy that he can't save everybody so again that's why it was more of a development for peter than it really was dr octopus but ultimately uh doc ock and blackie gaxton end up escaping so on and so forth and there's a few little skirmishes here and there right a few little things that take place over the course of the ensuing spider-man comics they end up seeing dr octopus facing off against peter parker being defeated and then being thrown in jail and so on and so forth and this is where everything changed when it came to Doc Ock and moved him away from being a villain that was just a typical guy who's got some kind of an ability and wants to achieve some, you know, megalomaniacal thing like 
conquering the world and actually elevated him into becoming one, a more relatable character, and two, one of the most iconic villains of the Spider-Man mythos. This was the introduction of the Sinister Six. And the reason why this was so important is because up to this point in time, by and large, whenever you saw villain groups that existed, they had come into existence by way of either having previously existed in the first place or a need or a desire or something along those lines, but it never really came from a place of a villain admitting they couldn't do it on their own. And that's what was going on with Dr. Octopus, that, that Otto Octavius had come to this realization he couldn't defeat Spider-Man by himself. Now, on the publishing side, Marvel did this because it would sell like gangbusters, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> There's no arguing that point, right? That's why Stan Lee and them did this because it would sell like crazy because by the time the Sinister Six was invoked, you already had Electro, Mysterio, you already had a lot of these villains that were, were mainstays for Spider-Man who was already the most popular superhero that Marvel had running far and away, right? That was, there was, there's no arguing that during, that at this point in time, Spider-Man was and really remains to this day, the single most popular superhero that Marvel has ever and likely will ever create. And so gathering these different foes together and then having Dr. Octopus kidnap Aunt May as a way to bring in Peter Parker is what kind of elevated the, the role of Dr. Octopus because one, he was the one who was leading the group and two, he's the one that planned out how they were going to win. Because the idea here was that when he looked at Peter Parker facing off against various members of his rogues gallery, he came to the realization that it was usually always Peter Parker leading them to a place where Peter Parker would have a better chance of defeating them. What the Sinister Six did is they flipped it on its head and they said, we're going to bring Peter Parker to a place place where we are most likely to win, right? So that's why each member of the Sinister Six fought Spider-Man in a place that was the most conducive to the nature of their powers. Now, of course, again, kind of working and, and building up on Spider-Man a little bit. And again, I don't want to turn this into like a kind of Spider-Man explained, but it is pretty important here. One of the things that was established was that even in the face of seemingly overwhelming defeat, Spider-Man seemed to still be able to find a way to win. But for the development of Dr. Octopus, one of the things that was so intriguing here was that unlike a lot of villains that were out there that would kill whoever they needed to kill or do whatever they needed to do in order to win, that he actually never mistreated Aunt May. And in fact, Aunt May loved hanging out with Dr. Octopus because he was so uh, so charming when it came to her. We know he was manipulative, but he was also extremely charming and treated her incredibly well. And so that kind of changed a lot of the viewer perception of Doc Ock, moving him away from being a guy who was just this villain of the week to a guy who's kind of like, hey, like there's a little more to this guy than, we, than, than we're really familiar with. And now, one of the interesting things here is that when it came to Dr. Octopus, even after this, right, the Sinister Six just elevated him and made him exceedingly popular. Unlike what you saw with a lot of villains who were out there, right, different writers taking over the handling of Spider-Man, a lot of the Spider-Man comics just, you know, just spinning out into even more comics to the point that it was almost just an unruly roster of Spider-Man comics. It was ridiculously hard to follow. Everybody seemed to nail Dr. Octopus, right? I have yet to discover an instance where Dr. Octopus in these early days had what you would call a bad story. Most of these early stories, I absolutely love. Now, most all of them saw him fighting against Peter Parker and then ultimately being defeated by Spider-Man, but more so than that, it actually saw Dr. Octopus doing things like taking over the role that was left vacant by uh, the Kingpin, Wilson Fisk, after he had left the United States following the death of Vanessa, as well as going to war with a lot of the other members of Spider-Man Rogues Gallery or even other members of the criminal underworld for the purpose of just consolidating power. These are usually always in in Spider-Man defeating him, but ultimately you saw some great moments here. One of the more interesting interesting things that happened during this time in Dr. Octopus's history actually ended up coming from Amazing Spider-Man issue number 397. Now, one of the things about this is that Dr. Octopus had a, uh, at least a, a kind of relationship with a girl named Mary Alice who was ultimately dying. The idea of Dr. Octopus was to search for a cure to basically end up saving her, right? But during the time, Spider-Man was also dying as well. And so what Dr. Octopus had done in kind of an honorable moment here, although not really honorable per se because he wanted to be the one to kill Spider-Man, he actually ended up creating a cure for Peter Parker that would ultimately save him. So in effect, this villain ended up saving his own character's life. Now, the reason why this mattered was really because of the fact that Dr. Octopus had really come into contact with a lot of, of what you would consider to be some of the more brutal villains or anti-heroes in Marvel. The Punisher, people like Black Cat, things along those lines. He had fought a lot of these guys. And it was one of these cool things because you actually go back and you look at Fantastic Four number 267 and you actually find out that, that Dr. Octopus was was supposedly suffering from multiple personality disorder as he was diagnosed by, by Mr. Fantastic. But his involvement in Secret Wars, the fact that he was one of the most notable villains uh, that was brought along in this particular storyline, it was things like this that made the comics so interesting and so intriguing when it came to the function, the form and function,
adaption of Dr. Octopus in Marvel Comics. But despite how great a lot of these early stories were, and you start getting into the 1990s. <laughs> particularly in 1994, where you kind of struggle with liking some of the stories that Dr. Octopus had. <laughs> particularly in Spectacular Spider-Man 221, when he was killed by Kane. Now, following that and going into uh, The Amazing Spider-Man 426 through 428, you actually end up having him creating his own kind of assassin. Technically, when, once he's dead, like Carol Trainer ends up kind of becoming the new Dr. Octopus, which didn't really receive a lot of fanfare. Dr. Octopus himself is actually resurrected by the hand, and then there's a couple of skirmishes in between. And then ultimately, he tries to create his own assassin out of, uh, out of Charlotte Witt, which is not the most interesting thing ever but it was stuff like that that was kind of like eh, you know i don't i don't know if i can really get behind that <laughs> the reality of this and and really from my perspective dr octopus really from i would say the the mid 90s for about 10 years wasn't really all that interesting and instead he got interesting during the events of civil war now civil war was a really really cool concept when it came to dr octopus because one of the things that had happened during that story as most of you guys know either from our coverage of it or having read it on your own is that uh is that peter parker had basically unmasked himself and revealed to the world his identity as Peter Parker as kind of a demonstration that he trusted in the Superhuman Registration Act as it had been put forward by Iron Man. Now, the funny thing about this is that even back in the early Amazing Spider-Man stories, that Dr. Octopus had actually unmasked Peter Parker, but refused to believe that it actually was Peter Parker. Instead, he just saw him as just being some kid and that he was ultimately looking for, quote unquote, the real Spider-Man. The revelation in this was designed to kind of build on that by establishing that Peter Parker was actually Spider-Man. Like it really was him. And that ultimately Dr. Octopus had become pissed off and angry over the fact that Peter Parker, this teenage kid, had managed to defeat him so many times before. Now, a lot of the things that had kind of gone on here between like the Sinister Six, the idea that, uh, that, that Aunt May had been kidnapped by Dr. Octopus because he knew Peter Parker's identity as Spider-Man, that had been wiped away by this point in time, right? That had been basically removed from the picture. And a lot of Dr. Octopus's memories of those selective events had been taken away following his resurrection direction by the hand. It was a way for Marvel to kind of undo the fact that Dr. Octopus knew who Peter Parker was, and to a degree, kind of start with a bit of a fresh slate, not a wholly fresh slate, but you know, a little able to kind of rework the landscape to a degree. But ultimately, despite his rampage and being pissed off that Peter Parker is actually Spider-Man and, you know, trying to be part of the Thunderbolts and all that kind of stuff, he's ultimately arrested by S.H.I.E.L.D. and Thunderbolts issues 104 through 109 over the course of that story arc. And depending on who you talk to, and I'm, I'm really in this crowd, this is when you probably got Dr. Octopus at his absolute absolute most interesting, right? So the way this played out is it was all really part of an ongoing story written by a guy named Dan Slott, which really kicked off with Spider-Man Big Time. Right? Whenever anybody asks me, I want to start reading Spider-Man, where should I start? I usually say Big Time. Uh, Sal over at Comic Pop was the one who gave me that advice and I followed it and it had been a lifesaver, right? That guy knows more about Spider-Man than seemingly anybody that I've ever met over the course of my life. But uh, the cool thing about this is the way Dan Slott wrote this was that after everything that had happened with Dr. Octopus over the course of his life, the injuries he he'd sustained, all that kind of stuff, that he was in effect dying. The funny thing is that he had set plans in motion to ensure that he would survive. But the funny thing here is that all these plans that he had set up, his body breaking down and literally just kind of falling apart, all that was a backstory to what was happening in Spider-Man big time, right? During the events of like Spider Island, really more Dan Slott's run than big time, but during Spider Island and all that kind of stuff, all those things that were going on, everything happening here was happening in the background. But over the course of those background stories, you actually ended up learning that what Dr. Octopus had done is he had put a portion of his consciousness inside a little kind of device, which had ultimately latched itself to the body of Peter Parker. And that when the time was right, which had ultimately took place in Spider-Man issue number 700, that Dr. Octopus had full on taken over the, the body of Peter Parker and Peter Parker himself was just kind of a consciousness fragment that was left and then ultimately ended up dying off. And so what this did is it basically removed Peter Parker physically from the landscape of Marvel Comics and replaced him during what is probably one of the more interesting runs of Spider-Man, probably one of the best runs of Spider-Man, which we call Superior Spider-Man, which is basically when Dr. Octopus takes over the body of Peter Parker. It was a great story. At the time that story came out, a lot of Spider-Man fans called doom and gloom, right? They were like, this, like Marvel's gonna kill Spider-Man. They're gonna destroy interest in Spider-Man forever. Superior Spider-Man was actually pretty well received. A lot of people really, really liked it. I loved it. But one of the reasons why the story was so great is that it focused on the development of Dr. Octopus in the sense that up until that point, 
in time, he had kind of lived within this, these sort of confines of what you would expect a villain to be. Despite the fact that he broke some of the boundaries of what villains normally are, insofar as him like waging war against the criminal underworld, trying to consolidate all that power unto himself, which was not something that you normally saw among Spider-Man villains. Even if you saw it with other villains like Kingpin or something along those lines, at the end of the day, he was still a tried and true villain in Marvel in the traditional sense with a, a few small gleaming instances where he defied that standard. Over the course of Superior Spider-Man, it changed everything because he starts learning these small little lessons about what it means to actually be Spider-Man. One of the first things that happens here is he actually ends up getting a fight with Matt Gargan, the Scorpion, and during that conflict, punches his jaw off of his face. And that's when he realizes Spider-Man had been pulling his punches all this time. One of the other things that he also ends up realizing is that Peter Parker is highly intelligent, but just seems undisciplined. And so one of the things that takes place here is that over the course of the comic, Dr. Octopus actually starts moving away from being a villain as you would expect, especially when it came to Anna Marconi, the one that kind of helped him to sort of redeem himself, become a good guy, and actually starts becoming a good guy. Now, in the middle of Superior Spider-Man, you did get the whole Spider-Verse story, right? Which was a, a little bit of a, a, a kind of added benefit to Superior Spider-Man because what Dr. Octopus had to come to grips with is that during the Spider-Verse event, he ended up coming into contact with a future version of Spider-Man from the main Marvel Universe, who was Peter Parker. So it basically solidified that Peter was going to get his body back at some point in time. But between the lessons he'd learned alongside Anna, the lessons he'd learned being a superhero, what he actually started doing was working on something great. And so he actually started developing uh, Parker Industries. And the whole idea was to literally take all the technology that Peter Parker had used as Spider-Man and enhance it, right? Make it better. He also started doing things like developing his own technology that could make him a more effective Spider-Man. This was great. It was absolutely fantastic. Now, the funny thing is that at this point in time, and we've talked about this a lot in previous videos, Marvel was basically winding down a lot of their story arcs and they were heading in the direction of Secret Wars in 2015, right? The multiversal collapse. And it seemed as though Mar Marvel was rebooting it or really, uh, really marketing it as a potential reboot for the entirety of the Marvel Universe where everything was gonna be restarted from zero. In hindsight, I guess that's not really true. There wasn't really anything they said that it's going to be a reboot, but they also didn't say it was gonna be a reboot. So I guess they were kind of playing both sides in that instance. But regardless of how you, how you look at it, what you ended up seeing is that at the end of Superior Spider-Man, that Peter Parker got his body back. And ultimately he was actually grateful for the stuff that Dr. Octopus had done. The development of Parker Industries, right? Creating, you know, using Parker Industries as one part think tank, one part charitable organization. And so while you only got a couple of story arcs, right? About 12 issues for Amazing Spider-Man when Peter Parker came back, that goes into Secret Wars 2015. And then you go into all new, all different Marvel. Now, the funny thing here is that, you know, in the aftermath of Superior Spider-Man and all that kind of stuff, that you ended up having uh, Dr. Octopus who had basically taken over the body of a robot basically, and just kind of lived with inside this, this robot and largely operated in the background, right? There really wasn't a, a whole lot that he had going on there. But the notion of the living brain was a cool concept because it gave us this idea that Dr. Octopus was almost in the same capacity as Iron Man, a futurist, right? Looking to the horizon, looking to the future. And he's always kind of one step ahead of everybody else in terms of his intelligence. The way this had played out is that when it came to him developing this kind of machine body for himself, he had actually used technology from the uh, from the future of Miguel O'Hara, right? Spider-Man 2099. He had used technology from that era, brought it back to the modern day, and then literally placed his consciousness inside of it because he knew that once he, once Peter Parker had gotten his body back, the only body left for Dr. Octopus was his dead body, right? The one that was basically dying. And so knowing that he was gonna die, he essentially backed himself up and then just kind of continued on. Now, the idea of him being confined inside this body went all the way up into the events of uh, Clone Conspiracy. Now, Clone Conspiracy was a great story. A lot of us were really concerned it was gonna be like Clone Saga, which was a terrible story in the 1990s, but Clone Conspiracy basically dealt with the Jackal uh, who was literally going around, right? Miles Warren was going around and basically resurrecting people using clones, giving them new bodies, different things along those lines in a bid to mass power. And during the end of the story, what Dr. Octopus had done is that actually been giving himself a new body that was by all standards of measurement, a clone of Spider-Man, and then went forward as superior Spider-Man yet again, this time facing out on the West Coast. But unlike previous Spider-Man stories, it was really a continuation of what we had seen happen with superior Spider-Man, where he wasn't really going out and doing villainous things. Instead, he was largely fighting as what you would expect a hero to be. Now, despite how interesting the new superior Spider-Man comic was and having Otto Octavius fighting out in San Francisco as what was basically Spider-Man West Coast, at the end of the day, it didn't last. And that was for a couple different reasons. The first was because the comics just weren't selling all that well. And it kind of made sense. Superior Spider-Man, if I'm being honest, really only ever should have been a particular comic book run 
done and never should have been maintained for the long term, but it was so popular that Marvel took a shot at it and it just didn't quite get the reception they were hoping for. The other part of this is that Dr. Octopus, as the guy with the tentacles and the megalomania and the villain of Spider-Man, is his most iconic form. And that's really what people wanted to see. And so what you ended up getting at the conclusion of Superior Spider-Man was basically a deal that was made with Mephisto where Dr. Octopus would go back to being his villainous self in response to gaining the power to defeat a version of Spider-Man from Earth 44145, who is basically Norman Osborn due to everything that had popped off with the second conflict with the inheritors and all that kind of stuff, right? Spider-Verse 2, if that's what you want to call it, wasn't nearly as good as the first one. But uh, because of the, the conflict between the two, this led to, uh, you know, Dr. Octopus basically accepting the deal of Mephisto. Now, in reality, this was beautifully handled. It was really cool because if you would follow the story of Dr. Octopus, even if you only started in Superior Spider-Man and you knew enough about him to understand the significance of him becoming, you know, Spider-Man and the kind of change of character that he experienced, then seeing it all basically come to a head uh, during the during the ending of Superior Spider-Man Volume 2 was pretty devastating because he had basically thrown away all the progress that he'd made. The nature of the deal was such, though, that he had basically lost all his memories as Peter Parker and kind of gone back to Dr. Octopus as he existed right before the events, of, uh, or really during the events of the first uh, Spider-Verse event. So he was basically Dr. Octopus as, as, you know, classic Octopus as you remember him, right? And just went back to his life of villainy. And in reality, I do welcome kind of the, retain, the, the return to the status quo. I mean, at the end of the day, anybody who's been reading comics for any real measure of time knew that was coming. But at the same time, it's also a little bittersweet because the progress of him becoming a good guy over the course of the Superior Spider-Man stories was fantastic, right? It was so cool. But at the moment right now, things are still unplaying in the Sinister War as it's taking place in, uh, in, in the Spider-Man comics, which we actually need to cover uh, because Sinister War is really, really cool. We really need to get caught back up again on Spider-Man. But nonetheless, you know, at this moment right now, Dr. Octopus is back to his old self, doing his old self stuff, right? So uh, with that being said, guys, hopefully this teaches you everything you need to know about Dr. Octopus. Again, we kind of had to skim over a lot of the finer points. There's a lot to cover here. We're literally talking about a guy who's been around since like 1964. Uh, there's just a lot, there's just too much history to cover in a single video. So I do have a podcast idea and maybe we'll do it with this one, right? Where I basically make like an hour long podcast that does like a far more in-depth comprehensive explanation about characters than what we do here because even as long form as this is, sometimes it's just not long enough. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. Thank you guys for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.